You're one of the hardest working guys I know. You know, I keep keep track of your tour schedule and stuff. I found out about you through Chuck Reagan, and I think 2017 we did a few West Coast dates. And what 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 gets you pumped about uh, about the road? Like, what is it that just kind of keeps you trucking? You know, multiple decades of just doing it. I think there's a couple things. I mean, what gets me stoked is the idea of of uh, of connecting through music. And um, that's always been the goal. I think that's the goal in writing songs and wanting to be heard in the initial sort of growth spurt of wanting to make songs. But then the whole playing shows thing, like it just got into my blood when I was a teenager, whether it was like, you know, the excitement or the dopamine rush or something like that. Um, That's part of it. It's less a part of it now. Um, It's more the connection. It's like bringing, um, you know, bringing people together in, in live music is a thing that's just so, um, it's so connective. It's so special. You have uh, disparate personalities and, and worldviews and things like that. And there's nothing like music to kind of connect all those dots. So I think, um, for me, that's like one of the, the driving, the driving factors. That's still what makes me most excited about it. And I think in, in terms of like staying on the road, part of that is economics. You know, it's just how how I make a living. Um, and, you know, the, the main thing for me is making songs and making records. And so, you know, in this day and age, in order to get those records firmly planted into people's lives, the people who do care, you, you come and play the songs for them. So um, it's kind of the same thing it's always been it's just like you know slight variations in in um in emphasis so like i'm more i more emphasize the connection rather than the uh the sort of the egocentric part of performing that's cool that you got that you got started touring and getting on the road so young um i remember i i didn't really have any kind of uh musical mentors i was kind of in a little bit of oasis in like madison wisconsin early on so it took me a little while longer to get going but did you have like a person or like a band or a mentor that showed you like you could actually get on the road anyone that just helped you out and kind of showed you what touring is yeah so you to do um it? i i was in a a high school hardcore band called step ahead in philadelphia and we played local shows we played around on the east coast we got as far as Boston or Richmond, something like that, in both directions, um, and maybe out, out as west, maybe as far as say Pittsburgh. But um, then Kid Dynamite came along uh, in Philadelphia, and they were, you know, they had members of Lifetime and so forth, and and they had more of an established touring plan. And I was their roadie, so Step had played with them. Um, we became friends, and they took me on the road as their merch guy. They were opening for Snapcase, and and that was back then. That was a big tour, um, and so that was my first brush with being in a van and seeing how it works and seeing you know the the um, the touring economics play out. And from there, I got hired. Um, they broke up. I got hired by Sick of It All, and then and they were an international touring band. Like you know, they had played everywhere on earth. At that point, it was like Sick of It All and Fugazi had taken punk kind of the farthest in terms of different reaches of the world. They had been, you know, all through Asia and Australia and things like that. So I got a pretty big jump in terms of what my understanding of the road was. And from there, I started guitar teching for the Bouncing Souls. And they were an established band as well. They were on big tours. They were playing to a thousand people or something. And, um, and once you're doing that and you're doing that circuit and you go to Europe and you start to meet other bands, Flogging Molly, things like this, like different bands that were either opening for them or they were opening for, um, you get a pretty, um, wide view of what's possible or, or the way that touring works. And so by the time I started my first real band, like my first band that was, um, sort of signed and so forth. It was called The Curse. It was the the band right before The Loved Ones. Um, we were on tour with Avail and and uh, things like that. So so we were sort of in that punk rock loop of, um, you know, playing a lot of the same clubs that I had been through with those other bands. 
Okay. And then, so did you always have kind of a business savvy? Was that something you were interested in early on as like a, a band leader where you're like, all right, here's the plan. Let's go, let's go execute it. Um, not exactly. I think that in order, you know, like I'm a working class guy and, um, no one I knew had any kind of idea of, of like a musical career. You know, when I was a kid in the eighties, it was like you, you could be U2 or Van Halen or Madonna or something, or Bruce Springsteen. There was no punk rock. Um, I mean, that stuff was, I guess, developing, but I was just a child. And I think, um, as I went and I saw these bands essentially living working class lifestyles um, by playing music, I was like, oh, okay, that's interesting. And any of the business stuff that I kind of did was as a means of survival. So like I started a construction business when I started The Loved Ones so that I could tour and still like own a house. Essentially, I was used to making money as a roadie. It was decent money. Um, and then I was going into a band situation where I was going to make next to nothing. And I was like, well, I can't make next to nothing. I have a mortgage. This is back in the early 2000s, 2003 or something. And so I started a construction company with a partner of mine from high school who was a really gifted carpenter. And we, um, we did that and that kept money coming in so that I could go be in, in a band and tour and make very little money. So a lot of it is just by circumstance or by necessity to kind of keep the lights on. And then as I kept going and ultimately when I went solo, it became a lot, a lot cleaner and more direct. It was like, well, it's just me and you can make a living if you have a small audience and, and you kind of know how to tour and, and not spend too much money and so forth. So that kind of get, got me through that early stage. And then from there, it's been building and trying to determine how things work in the music industry and trying to keep as much of the machinations of how the music industry works in-house so that we don't have to give huge portions of the earnings away. That's kind of been the, the trajectory. So when you first start doing your own solo thing and you're like, oh, I can I can rally 50 people in a room if, if and like make it work. Were you playing any like strange kind of weird venues? I imagine it was a little bit of a different circuit. Tell me about that. That was again, it was a little bit circumstantial. My in intention was to keep going with the loved ones. We were signed to a record label and we had toured internationally and we had a following. And then the 2008 crash happened and my uh, construction business took a big hit about a year out. Like, you know, in the 2008 to 2009 year, suddenly a lot of work dried up. So a lot of people who were making good money in construction uh, were suddenly making either nothing or very little. And so, uh, and then the band, you know, it was harder to tour with the band because we were in a, you know, an economic downturn. So someone just called me, a, a, a friend of mine up in Canada, and was like, hey, would you do this solo tour? just come with an acoustic guitar all through Canada. Um, and I had done a couple shows or like little bits and bobs there, here and there. Um, but I hadn't really intended to start a solo career then. And um, <clears throat> I went on this solo tour. It was me and a guy uh, called Matt who, who goes by Northcote. And he was just starting out too. He was in a hardcore band and he was trying to do more of a folk influence kind of thing. And we got into a sedan and drove from essentially, I think it was Quebec City or Montreal was as far east, all the way out to Vancouver. And um, at that point, it was like, well, I'll make more doing this with a couple t-shirts and no even release. I didn't even have a solo release. I didn't have loved ones vinyl with me or anything like that. I just kind of had a t-shirt and maybe a demo or something. I don't remember. Um, and uh, I was like, I can make more doing this than I can at home as a carpenter. So it was kind of a survival thing. I had always sort of thought I would do a solo record because I felt that punk rock had its limitations in terms of what people would accept from me as a songwriter. And so I thought, well, I, I kind of want to do something a little more in the singer-songwriter vein at some point. And it just, that, that 2008 crash just accelerated that plan uh, to the forefront. Big time. I remember that's kind of when I started. And I remember gas being like four bucks a gallon, even in the Midwest, you know, where I'm at. Yeah. And it was like, it was like fairly insurmountable, you know? Yeah, it was tough. I mean... 
I guess in the instance of this tour, um, the vehicle might have been free. I forget what the, like maybe Matt Northcote um, had the vehicle, so we didn't have to rent. And so it was like, all right, well, we'll split the gas and we'll just stay with friends and stuff. So it was real kind of ramshackle and thrown together. But there were people at all the shows, and um, that was heartening. I was like, oh, okay, so somebody's interested, and this is a foreign country. You know, it wasn't like we were playing yeah. New Jersey and Philly. Um, and then, you know, fast forward over time, I made the Resolutions record. Because I was like, well, now's as good a time as any. It seems like the band, it, it was harder and harder to conceive of the band going back out um, after like 09, 10, something like that. And by the time I put Resolutions out, I got invited to be on the Revival Tour over in Europe. And it was a perfect storm of having a new record out, being on stage with three other like known songwriters. It was Dan Andriano, Chuck Reagan, and Brian Fallon. And... I was treated like an equal, but all these people at the show were like, well, who's this guy? We've never heard this guy. Um, maybe there was a couple Loved Ones fans or something there, but that gave me a jump start in Europe that essentially I'm still yeah. riding that wave. I mean, I made a lot of connections with people there and in terms of like people who love the music and I just kept going back. I got a couple other big support tours after that and and then started to headline and, and now you know, all these years later, it's like a huge part of our audience is, is in the UK and Germany and Netherlands and stuff like that. So, yeah, they're, they're really loyal in, uh, yeah, especially in mainland Europe for that kind of acoustic punk. There's like a proper, proper circuit for it. Um, so I that's think a beautiful that they're, thing. I think that they're loyal for everything. Um, I think any, any music, music and culture are just held or held in a higher regard, um, throughout Europe. Um, than they are in the States. Like, I think, uh, I've heard quotes from Neil Young and Bruce Springsteen and all these people that essentially say, like, in Europe, you can always kind of either maintain or or, or accelerate slightly in terms of, like, people just, more and more people catch on and, and the, the people who've been there for a while keep coming. And in America, you're always bound to do this, which I think yeah. is, that was good to hear from some of the most successful um songwriters of all time just in an in, you know in an interview somewhere but it was interesting to to pick up those tidbits and go okay um so if it's true for them scalably it's got to be true for for us too what do you think that is why do you think europe holds uh, the arts in much higher regard i think that their work to life balance is is better um i think that culture I think that, you know, they've had a lot of time to make mistakes and to correct mistakes. Um, you know, two world wars, um, uh, you know, a huge um, exodus of people, you know, leaving to start the United States, I think. I think over time, um, but, well, I mean, and I guess the dark underbelly of that is colonialism, where, you know, a lot of these countries, they um, had colonies that generated tons and tons of money, which puts them in a wealthy situation. And they have, you know, endless amounts of resources, you know, the UK and Germany and, and Belgium and stuff like that. Like, so I think that whole pie is, is kind of why the work-life balance is possible to be a little more reasonable. It's not just cutthroat capitalism the way that America seems to be right now. And um, I think that there's a lot of spiritual, you know, secular spiritual awakening, you know, in, in, in especially in Germany. Um, you figure that we're a couple generations away from the Second War. And I think uh, reckoning with what your forefathers were capable of and trying to do better might sort of lean you more towards the arts. But I, these are just my theories, like having been over there a bunch. I, I don't actually know. There's got to be, um, you know, sociologists or something that study this stuff. But I think um, generally it, it all kind of coalesces around a real passion for culture. Um, they also protect their citizens from... Um, social media a little bit better, which I think helps extend your um, attention span. Um, I, there's a host of reasons. 
as like a talking about like work life balance as a you know hard work and fellow yourself have you ever hit a point in your trajectory where you just overdid the work and just it kind of like affected you mentally having to take a break yeah um i would say that's happened a couple times and i maybe wasn't fully aware of it happening um it was maybe in conjunction with a lot of other life events but I mean, the Loved Ones band was essentially was, uh, that was an engine that I ran really hot and really hard. Um, and obviously, it, they don't really exist anymore. We're doing one reunion show at our festival in May, and we haven't played in eight years. Um, and before that, it had been, I think, 10 years or something. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think there's instances over time where you realize like, oh, maybe we're going a little hard at this or what exactly is the goal here? And I think over time, hopefully, if this stays your job, you have to put certain stop gaps in to maintain mental health. I mean, I tour with my brother and, and he and I own the label and, and uh, we co-write the songs. And so there's a little bit of, it's helpful to have someone that you love that much as your partner because you don't want to see anything ill happen to your to your brother. So I want to look out for his mental health, and I think he's looking out for mine. So I think that helps. And also, you know, we have a great manager who respects the work-life balance. And, you know, we recently had an opportunity to play with, like, a big band, but it was my wife's 40th birthday. Um, or it's going to be my wife's 40th birthday. And I just said, no, I, I'm sorry, man. I, I can't. I'm sure that would be a great opportunity to play with this giant band, but like, I can't do it. And he's cool about it. Like I've had other managers or bookers or whatever who have been more adamant about, oh, if you want this to happen, you're going to have to, you know, and I think that my mentality was that too. So um, I think that change, that drift into being confident that like, you don't need to do every single thing. Um, do what's comfortable and maintain your sanity. And this way you can perform and write and um, yeah. and be your best. You know, you don't want your family life to be in, in shambles um, just because you can draw a hundred more people and fill in the blank city. It's, it's not worth it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure, Dave. And it's like, you you you're you when you're young, you kind of just feel like you can take over the world. And then all of a sudden you realize time, time and, uh, and battery are, are real things and you got to be efficient. Yeah. Yeah. You don't, you don't want to, I mean, you can't take over the world. There's only so much. Um, I also think it's important to kind of assess what that, what that um, ambition is. Why do you want to take over the world? Um, what is it that you're trying to fulfill? You know, is it a need that you need met in another way that allows you to be more comfortable or, you know, I, I like I'm into the psychology of, you know, I'm, I'm in therapy. My wife's a therapist. So I think for me, a lot of it is, is trying to figure out what your motivation is and why, and then make minor tweaks in order to, to try to be like a, the most whole person you can be. And how much does therapy helps that? It's helped. Um, I think it's a great tool. Um, sobriety has helped too. I'm I'm like eight years into that. Um, you know, I think it does take a certain type of person who wants to be, who wants to change and to be open to change to even engage with any of those ideas. So I do think some of it is just like an innate wanting to be better. But I think um, once you seek those tools and hopefully put them into practice, um, you can see benefits from it. I mean, you know, it's little stuff too. It's like you want to you want to be healthy in terms of what you eat and move your body around and things like that. I mean, it's just all that stuff is important um, in maintaining your mental health, even if you don't sing for a living or put out records. But I think even more so if you do. Um, because it's such a weird, it's such a weird job. It's wildly destabilizing, Dave. I, I was talking to Freedy Johnston. I'm sure you, you've come across Freedy. Yeah, uh, he's great. I, he's the man. Yeah, I, I asked him straight up, like, uh, 
you know, do you have any advice for young musicians, you know, who want to, you know, make music for a living? And he just looked at me and uh, dead, dead in the face, he's like, don't do it. Do not do it. Whatever you do, don't do it. It's bad. It's bad for you. It's bad for you. And, you know, I can often not tell if he's kidding or not. And I think he's just one of those guys that uh, is just hilarious whether he means to be or not. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's le it's legitimate advice. It's a wobbly situation. I mean, it's as legitimate as, oh, you should do it because it fills your life with joy yeah, and totally. could make you a millionaire. You know, like, I mean, either one of those pieces of advice are just as valid. I mean, I don't know. I wouldn't give anybody either real advice. I'd just say, like, I mean, the funny thing about that question is always, like, you have to take the person into, into consideration. What kind of person are you talking to when you're talking to that young musician? Um, is it somebody with a little bit of talent? Because I think that could that could change the, uh, yeah. the thing. Um, I don't know. Yeah, that's funny. I mean... I wouldn't say not do it. I mean, I think life is short and, um, you know, joy can be found in a lot of different ways. I, I mean, I certainly wouldn't push my kids towards it or away from it. I don't, I, sure. it, it'll just depend on like what their, what their interests and motivations are, you know? Is there any advice you received as a, as a younger person, young musician that you remember that really stands out in your mind? Yeah, I mean, there was a bunch. Um, I had a couple people. I had a guy, a family friend who taught me all my construction skills, my carpentry skills, who told me he didn't think I had it. Um, he couldn't imagine. I can't imagine that you're good enough to go make this your career. Um, and that negative uh, thing helped, you know, help me want to prove something early on. Sure. Um, but no, more positively, I mean, both The Bouncing Souls and a band called The Explosion that I worked with, both of those people were dear, dear friends. And they were like, look, man, you got to go do this. You got to go do this on your own. Like, you, you, we don't, we don't want you tuning our guitars if it means you're not singing your songs. And it was interesting because I couldn't tell at the time from The Explosion if they just wanted me to, out of the, you know, if they wanted to not fire me but then two of the guys from the band joined the loved ones so it was like this full circle thing and and the bouncing souls ended up like taking the loved ones out everywhere and and um you know they've taken me out on tour solo and things like that so i don't think as it was because they wanted me out of their hair i actually do think they were doing such a kind thing to say like hey you should do this and to have people who were doing it professionally um encourage you to like Hey, use your gift and shine your light and go, go, go. That was like incredibly helpful. Um, and uh, and they didn't really have any financial gain in it. You know what I mean? They they, they didn't have record labels or or um, you know t-shirt printing businesses or any of that kind of stuff. They just were like, you should do this, man. It's fun. And that was incredible. And I I still think back, like I still have such a fondness for those guys. Just because they're wonderful, but also because that's a that's a pretty significant gift to give your roadie. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing more magical than than making friends with other bands and being a huge fan of their yeah. art. You know, yeah. that is like a that is like the, the the holy shit epiphany of friendship. That's really cool. Yeah, I mean, there to to um, to bring it back to that revival tour. I mean, I was out on that. With, uh, you know, Dan Dan and the Alkaline Trio and then Chuck and Hot Water Music were two of my favorite bands. I mean, they were like big brothers to me. And then Brian and I had toured together with Loved Ones and Gaslight, and we were like mutual admiration society. We really clicked. And so to be up on stage with those guys and have them treat me like an equal because it was like a songwriter round. It was like everybody got to play a song or whatever. Yeah. Um, was incredible and they each pulled me aside on that tour um privately and they were like hey we don't want to be the guy who breaks up the loved ones but you should keep going solo this is working like people really like this you should keep doing this and it was funny i was like you know the chuck just told me the same thing you know and they were like well yeah you know you should listen to him so that was another spot where you know that encouragement was really helpful and you know there's been heroes and friends along the way in many instances i mean i'm 46 so i think at a certain point um 
you do this enough and, and you have enough of an audience that you start to have some level of confidence in your abilities and say like, okay, well, I've been doing this a long time. And even if it's on a small level or whatever, um, but I think any word of encouragement from a friend, I mean, I recently saw Frank Turner, he came out to our show in London and he texted me after a really sweet, glowing review of the show, you know, and I, and he was like, I don't really do this, but I'm trying to do this more because when, when a friend of mine that I believe in does something awesome, I want to encourage them. And I was like, well, that's so rad. You know, I think like, as we get older, we do less of that. And I thought it was a beautiful gift of him to give me, you know, he was like, man, the show just knocked me out or whatever. He had positive things to say essentially. But I think, uh, anytime you can give somebody that gift, um, it, it feels good. You know, it, it gives you a little bit more, um, fuel for your fire. Totally. Yeah, totally. Dave. I mean, compliments are, they're really, it's a really intimate thing, right? It's like, it <laughs> can feel strange. It can feel uncomfortable to give them and it's even more uncomfortable to receive them. You know what I mean? It's like, it, like it's easier over text, you know, but it's like, it can be hard to take a compliment right to the face for whatever yeah. reason. It's intimate, you know? It, you're right. It's true. And I, I think, um, I try to be, I try to love the things that I love fully. And I think, um, you know, trying to honor the people that make them. If I get a chance, like I don't get a chance to interact with Martin Scorsese, but if I do get a chance to see Hot Water Music, you know, and say, hey, those new songs are so awesome. Hopefully, even if they squirm and like, oh man, you know, you know, maybe they'll still take that home and go, okay, well, this is this is a friend of mine who has listened since the 90s yeah. or whatever. And maybe that does, I mean, it helps me. So I assume it probably helps other people. So I, I think um, it's important to to try to do that as much as you can. It, it, it's Absolutely. helped me. Yeah. And especially too, I mean, coming from sources, you know, aren't going to blow smoke up your ass too. That's true. Like, you know. Right. My, my, my parents are like pretty brutal critics. Like even oh, though wow. my, my mother doesn't really listen to music much but like she'll tell me if a song is shit or you know <laughs> if like our show was was mediocre and funny enough like she's might be the least informed person i know about music but i i actually take her uh her opinion into consideration you know yeah it's a weird thing i mean i think i think it's important to have sounding boards when you're making stuff that you trust but once you make them and you do that fiercely in terms of your artistic vision and you put it out there, let people say whatever they're going to say. Um, you know, I think like it's a weird, it's a weird thing. I'm, I make the songs that I want to hear. And I think that's an important thing to keep um, at the top, you know, as, as your sort of North Star, how people respond to them. Yeah, that's kind of just like the breeze, you know? And I think what we're talking about is more, you know, if if you can extend a compliment, something you're already thinking. In other words, I don't want to bullshit anyone, and I don't want to be um, bullshitted. I, I, I think it's more if somebody sees it and goes, or hears it and goes, that was great, I appreciate when they say that, you know? like So it, it, it's a weird um, mix of, of the hell with it, I'm doing what I want, and... Wow, thank you for liking it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think I think you're right, man. I think just like every band should be making records that they want to go home and listen to even in their spare time and whether, you know, you want to admit it or not, it's uh I think that's that's the core to everything, you know. Like I think Frank so. Zappa, uh, you ever watched the Frank Zappa doc? Like Yeah, it's awesome. I, it's wild. Like a nutcase probably a huge ball ache to be around impossible to date like i'm not a particular for fan of frank zappa but uh he was just like his opinion was just unencumbered he's like i don't give a shit what you guys think i'm i'm in my little laboratory studio and i want to make albums that i want to go home and listen to even if it costs me a shitload of money and i have to hire like 60 orchestra members so yeah i love that i mean that's yeah. to me that's the punkest uh thing you could be you know that's the most ferocious thing you could be is um 
is deliberate in your intentions totally. with your art. Do what you want to do. And and I think that that's always been the trouble with the punk scene to me is like, well, wait a minute. I thought it was The Clash. I thought it was Joe Strummer. And a lot of it was like, well, no, we want you to sound this way or look this way. Like, oh, okay, well. Um, so, yeah, it's, yeah. it's an interesting thing. Um, and also, like, nowadays we have all these metrics in front of us. And I feel like that can affect the way you make art more than it ever has in the past. You know, uh, before maybe we were more blocked off from uh, seeing opinions immediately and we could just make stuff in a bubble. And yeah. it's hard. It's hard. You know, the data can really get you down and it's hard <laughs> to, to not look at it and not take it into consideration. And also just like, you know, you make songs that you really believe in and you're like, all right, well, can we just post it on the Internet? Because it might just get lost in the ether of infinite digital trash. So now you have to think about these release strategies more than ever, where you spend your marketing dollars. And I'm sure that's something you've had to wrestle with uh, running a label, too. To maybe talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I think all that's part of the game. Uh, all that does come up. All that with different records, I've had more or less struggles with how to view all that. But I think, again, it gets back to what your general baseline is. And for me, like, comparison is the thief of joy, as they say. And, you know, it's like my sister has that over Great her. quote. The, 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 my sister has three kids and over their coats, you know, where they hang their coats, there's that quote. So every time nice. I'm there, I see it and I remember it. Um, you don't want to compare yourself to others. I mean, that's number one. And number two, like... Yes, it is just going to get lost in the digital ether. Yeah. Um, except for it doesn't. Someone might hear it. And um, again, life is short and maybe it's meaningless. You know, I don't know. Um, and so why not give it your best try? And I think when it comes to those label decisions, you go like, well, we want to be heard. We want the records available. Um, I've never been a big proponent of like shoving anything down people's throats. You know, we're here. We make, we make, uh, these records that are kind of like cans of beans. Like they can stay on the shelf and you can pick them up and go, Oh, I'd love that tonight. I, I forgot I even had this. Um, or they can be, you know, an immediate meal for you tonight to like sink your teeth into. And I think for me, it's, the more records I've made, the less precious I am about how each one's going to do. Um, and in terms of like those data metrics and all that, like, I think it's never enough. Um, totally, we've charted totally. every time on billboard, whatever that means since the second record. And what does that mean? You know, what's the goal the next time to chart higher? It's like, I, okay. And, uh, I, I, in fact, you know, I think that the thing that drives, so, so I just watched the era's video, uh, movie, you know, the Taylor Swift era's movie and, this is a person who clearly has some of the biggest ambition on the planet to get that big and to be that ubiquitous and um, and to kind of have that much focus on you. She's got to have crazy ambition to get there, right? Um, but I actually think the thing that keeps it as close to pure as it can be is the fact that she loves making new stuff. She makes records all the time. She writes songs all the time. And when you're closer to that flame and, you know, to that, like, well, what can we come up with that's going to be compelling to us and then share with people? If you can stay closer to that and farther away from, like, all right, it's got to be heard by as many people as possible. Totally. Then you're just making new stuff and, and you might pick up new people and... and I mean, I love hearing, like, I just found out about you. I just came out to this seated show of acoustic music that you're, like, my new favorite guy. It's like, well, great. And, he's like, and people go, like, sorry. And I'm like, no, 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 this is great. And then maybe they'll we'll play an older song or something, and sure. and they'll go, oh, I want to get that record. And, you know, to me, it's, it's a long conversation with an audience that sometimes drifts in and sometimes drifts out. And that's okay. I mean, I, I think... You have to be flexible. You have to be able to pivot. Um, it's, it, it's, you know, I mean, that's, those are just life skills, let alone music business skills. Like I can't, you know, in some ways I've, I've come to view the, my own artistic walk as 
as a blessing. You know, a lot of my friends had success early on in their in their life. And now, 20 years in, when they go out with their band or whatever, you kind of know what songs they're going to play because they have to play the ones that got them successful in the first place. Right. That's okay. That's fine. We don't have to do that, though. Um, I can play whatever I want that night because each record is done better than the record prior. And that's a gift. You know, I wish I had a hit. I wish I could buy a house in California with all the money I made from one song or two songs. But that's not what happened. You know, that's not the way my life shook out. So if you want to, like, hold on to that and go, like, oh, I just need a hit, it's like, well, good luck. I, I, most when, people you have, <laughs> when you have the hit, you're like, oh, fuck this song. They want us to play it twice a night. Yeah, yeah I mean, in some classic. ways, like, I, I mean, I know plenty of people who... Um, you know, I talk, I've talked about this. I became friends with um, Joe Gittleman, the bass player for the Mighty Mighty Boss Tones and, the so and one of the songwriters in the Boss Tones. And I was like, what was that like to get that hit? And he was like, honestly, it felt like the minute it happened, it was already ending. And I think part of that is because he's a very intelligent guy. Like, he really understands the world. And he was like, you know, you go through L.A. on the hit. And you've got all these people in your backstage that are stars, that are like legitimate, like, oh my God, is that Madonna or whoever, you know? And he goes, but you know, the next time you play LA, they're not going to be there unless you have another uh -huh. hit. And he was like, and okay. I didn't know we'd get that hit. And so it was a really interesting perspective for him, you know, because to me, I'm like, that's something I've never obtained or, or attained or whatever the word would be. Um, my friend Will Hogue, too, he had a hit song on the radio. Um, he had a song of his taken to number one by another band. And I asked him about, well, what's that like? And he just was like, it's so far out of my control. He was like, I was watching it happen, but I was a spectator. I had written the song some years prior and stuff. So it's interesting to kind of get those perspectives um, and, and, and like be curious about them, but not be jealous about them. Because again, like, sure, that would be awesome, but I can't control that. And, Maybe I've just never written a song that has that kind of universal appeal. I don't know. I mean, but I have what well, the songs I have written um, have found an audience all over the world and, and they mean something to each one of those people and they mean something to me and we can share in that and it, there's this dignity in that um, that I can lean on. It's just a little awkward at like parent teacher night. <laughs> yeah yeah totally i mean talking about hits like in the modern day i don't even know if there are hits anymore and you know even pre-internet when it was a more structured label system and more classic music industry so to speak i mean you could write a great you could write the best song ever created in north in the northern americas and it, if you didn't have the right money the right a and r yeah. guy it wasn't a hit like hits are are just a fluke i think i think it's just a fluke it's like eight different things colliding all at once you know yeah there's a lot of um strange factors that go into that kind of success that um that i've learned about from other people but uh yeah it's it's interesting it's a to me you know there's other people there's other careers that i'm um that i think of as more of guiding lights you know elvis costello or you know, Jenny Lewis, like there there are other performers and writers that I'm like, oh, that's cool. They they keep making stuff and keep moving forward. Um, and they're not reliant on one or two songs. They they rely on the whole catalog. And that's that's cool. It kind of encourages you to always do as sturdy work as you can and, and For sure. Uh, yeah. And, and, keep and, going. and that's gotta be way better on your brain than, you know, yeah, the hit as the crutch. Actually, I got a film wreck for you, Dave House. Just before I talking to you today, I was watching the. Uh, have you ever seen the Elephant Six Recording Company documentary? No. It, like we're talking about, like you know, yeah, creating yeah. with uh, with reckless abandon and not worrying about yeah. what people think. This was like a Neutral Milk Hotel, oh, uh, Apples yeah. and Stairs, like this low. All these lo-fi bands in uh, rural Louisiana. They moved to right. Athens, but just like a collective of like 20 just really weirdos spectrum dwellers no goals for success the fact that success came just a complete fluke uh, but they had this whole like 
psychedelic movement and they would re record everything to analog tape and four mm -hmm. tracks and have potlucks in their yard and do psychedelics <laughs> and cool. um, really cool doc really inspiring to just I, I think we all need that reminder to just uh, just make shit and uh, not yeah. think about the other side or the or the marketing yada yada but that that I mean that's the most cathartic way to live as a as a creative person yeah i don't i don't have a whole lot of interest in the alternative i i like making songs i like especially i like making them with my brother and the various people we've gotten to make records with and and stuff like i i just that practice is my favorite thing to create something out of nothing um and and you know and I, then i like to share them with people so if you can keep those as your main goals um you know, to me, in a lot of ways, like money is just, uh, oh, cool, nice hair. Um, money is just kind of coal to put into that un engine. You know, like you're shoveling money, throwing it into the fire, it burns it up and it keeps you, go it allows you to get to the next show. It allows you to get to the next record. It allows you to buy food for your family or whatever. Like it's not the goal. It's not the goal. If it was the goal, I would have gone into a different, um, into a different business as a young person. I could have gone into business, you know, into, into, uh, finance or something like that. It's just, I'm just not as into that. I mean, I, I have this, um, workout group here in Santa Barbara that I go to in early morning, you know, like five thirty in the morning and there's finance guys there and they're always they're if we're having coffee afterwards they're usually asking me what it's like to play in paris or spain or something sure. and i'm typically not asking a whole lot of questions about well what kind of dividends can i get on this stock like i just <laughs> people tend to understand that and they only take that so far and the amount of adventure and creativity that goes into this kind of work is is inspiring to lots of people so i think um again i i don't I don't plan. I don't think you have a lot of days on this earth, um, so I'd rather spend them doing something that that brings a lot of joy to myself and hopefully to a lot of other people. Dave House, Haws, 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 you, you'll get it. <laughs> you're the man. Uh, you're very inspiring. It's great talking to you. It's been fun to follow your uh, your tunes and your adventures and uh, oh, your thanks, road man. stuff. Yeah, Thank what's you. the best place to steer people at the moment? Uh, specific album, specific project, specific link? It's all at DaveHaas.com. That's D-A-V-E-H-A-U-S-E.com. Um, you can find a link to our festival, the Sing Us Home Festival. That's uh, May 3, 4, and 5. You can find links to the most recent record, which is Drive It Like It's Stolen. And then when you're in there, the best thing you can do, in my opinion, for any artist, if they have it and they use it, is a newsletter. Um, if you sign up to the newsletter, we we give people, I mean, that's free, um, but we give people as much of the inside information as we possibly can. So if we're putting on a small show in a town, we'll give people on the newsletter first crack at the tickets. Or yeah. if nice. we're putting out a limited vinyl, we, you know, we try to honor that newsletter fan base as kind of the center of the bullseye. Totally. Um, and then newsletter. all the social... Newsletter's yeah. the mothership, Dave. I, yeah, it's I'm great. Fully, you can control I'm with it, you, right? man. Yeah. I'm you so with you. you. There's no algorithm for it um, that, that squashes your your reach like they do on Facebook and stuff, which is, you know, that's fine too if you want to follow there. But um, Isn't that wild? It's like there's almost no... The only escape from the algorithm is the newsletter. There's nowhere else on the internet you can actually escape the algorithm. That's it. That's the only safe haven. Is Apple Music... I guess Apple Music has an algorithm too, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I guess you're right. I hadn't thought about that. That's wild. Email is immortal, Dave. <laughs> we'll see. I mean, sooner or later, somebody's going to figure out a way to uh, to take that power from us too, I would guess. But we'll see. I mean, let's hope. <laughs> For now, we got it. Thank you, Dave. Dirt from the road. Much love. Enjoy you, California. Yeah, man. All the best. <laughs>